So you've written about these walks for lonely people at Christmas. Yes. And you want to, talk, uh, to tell people all about these walks that you've designed specially for them. Yeah, right. And you're, so you're, you're David C. Gray. <laughs> yes. Introduce yourself and please tell us all about your, the walks you've, you've sketched out. My name is David Seagrave from a permanent fight, and until recently, I was exceedingly active as a hill walker. Uh, I have attempted to organize edifications for lonely people over excessive so-called festive season for 20 years and got nowhere because of obstruction by Christian people who insist that our Lord's birthday had to be observed in Gothic script. When I had transport of my own, I would venture as far as Pre and Larrick on a Lord's birthday and enjoyed the majesty of low clouds swirling below the summit of Ben Moore. One memorable Christmas day is no crap crown listened in the one December night and also the peaks at Girdle, Cray and Larrick. Now that was an edifying day out and there were other Christmas days when I could add a little car. Now I propose that if cars could be shared, the price of an expedition on Christmas Day, to the profit per head is that of the price of one solitary glass of beer. To as far as time room, two glasses of beer. And as far as Venco, with the majesty of those snow capped peaks, uh, viewable from the old road, easy strolls. The three glasses of beer. And this is somewhat problematic now as a uh, life from adult life leaving school and in 35 millimeter cameras. I am able to buy black and white 35 millimeter film in 30 meter length for 42 pounds per uncut length in a sealed tin. That works out at two pounds fifty for an equivalent equivalent set exposure length. Uh, and are we still recording, are we? Yes, we are. And the the firm in Somerset sells reloadable cassettes. Uh, the, the film I recommend is Kent Mill four hundred, which can even yield sharp pictures in overcast weather with a reloaded throwaway camera. And I developed it myself in a uh, developer formulated in 1890, still famous into Paris amongst photographic black and white developers. Now, uh, with this the total cost uh, yeah. Now, continuation. The total cost of a developed 35 millimeter black and white negative is tenpence uh, by my means. As for printing, I have hundreds of sheets of black and white paper, which yeah. I'll probably never use. That's a different ballpark. But the nominal notional cost of my standard size what uh, enlargement of 250 square centimeters is 30 pence per enlargement. 
as for colour, print film, the same firm in Somerset sells different types of film at a, a third of the price of the high street. If indeed a high street shop still sells colour print film, colour slide film is now exceedingly problematic and has to be sent away to Germany to be processed. That is a rather, though I've been doing this since 1963, there are complications. So for the Christmas Day hiker, with the dull weather prevailing, but snow listening on lofty peaks, I'm inclined to restrict initial hikes to black and white only. On rare days of bright sunlight, glancing low sunlight, it's marvellous. So Sally Forth, even with a reloaded throwaway camera, and I know how, get marvellous pictures of shadows passed by buildings in places like Addington. So this is now, as for these walks, this first walk is Agus now. It is an expedition into Edinburgh's little highlands. The traveller should proceed down the Royal Mile into the uh, big car park at the edge of Hollywood Park, cross the one way circular road, and follow a wild defined broad path which stays level over what geographers call a strath, a platform valley towards a prominent uh, feature, a miniature mountain clearly visible. It has to skirt a burn flowing out of a stream rising on the slopes of Art of Sheet and then bear round to the left. And then an almost indiscernible side path leads first steeply and then levels off to the summit of this dragon tail feature, which in some respects is a miniature of the Royal Mile dragon tail feature in every school child's geography book. The, the, ride, the continent rise is a modest 15 metres, if that, giving on to a small pile of stones that marks the summit. From that point to the west, there is a precipice, uh, uh, roughly the height of a bungalow. Keep clear of it. Uh, in all directions, there are wide views. Now, coming back down the dip slope of the dragon tail, there is a photographic belvedere, which has a very wide angle lens indeed. Uh, but the artist, with sitting comfortably, can sketch a view uh, as like those wonderful accidents you find in our galleries but subtly exaggerate the grandeur of Arthur's seat and the lower hills. Here he can recline uh, uh, to drink in a vista with nothing man-made in sight, just as though it was primeval. Now, walk number two, taking the hiker to the coastline. Uh, this is Avalady Bay. Easily reached by frequent buses from the city centre, bound for North Berwick. This, what, these series of walks skirt low lying promontories and are potentially wheelchair accessible. Uh, they provide a wheelchair pusher with expansive views of the coastline and the bird sanctuary at Avalady Bay, and the hiker can go 
far he was on almost level ground from Gosford Bay to uh, near enough to North Berwick. This would be ideal for confirmed people who enjoy bird watching. Now, more. Now, if you're recording, are you? Uh, yep, yep, we're recording. Now, we try that there. Now, it's come to my notice, everybody, uh, that single flat side roads to beauty spots in the top of that map area have been blocked off to non residents because of a lot of hearsay, mind you. Gangs of cattle rustlers have been stealing livestock from remote farms. To that end, the irate victims, collaborated with local authorities, put up electronic gates. Put, 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 chop, chop those onto that one, and then we put, we slide those onto the. Do this. Do this. Yes. Then we've got the yeah. space. Do this on top. Lovely. Thank, Thank you. Apparently, only residents and police vehicles and such like are now allowed proceed along single-track roads that lead to wheelchair-pushable uh, farm tracks past beauty spots, one of which was the south shore of Lot Atray. So access to certain places is apparently now forbidden because no cars allowed past these gates. However, one accessible walk is the waterboard road along the shores of Loch Catherine across here. So, people proceeding from the lowlands have either coming up from the Stirling direction by a calendar or by means of the Amphorl Road, the Duke's Path Road, to the end of Loch Acre, whereupon a short spur road leads to the big car park where a steamer, the Sir Walter Scott, is moored. Now, that at that point, you have to pay but then wheelchair pushers can easily proceed along the level waterboard road as far as they fancy and enjoy in two kilometers views of Rock Catherine of the gallant ship Sir Walter Scott and the surrounding mountains. When Ben Menu wears his winter raiment, they can photograph the mountain with the rock and the steamer in the foreground. Okay. Two kilometers along the track, uh, reaching Ellen's Isle, so much further still is Brennatrol Point, where ordinary able-bodied people have no difficulty in walking, at leaving the road, and in about 100 metres, 
find themselves on the shores of Mount Catherine and bang away at bits of down the lot. Well, this is called a cycleway. And cyclists can go right round the lot to into Gronach and pedal back. But in doing so, they have to squeeze through a gate. Uh, and that is it. Uh, because the road to Gronach and in the Snade but these really exciting mountains country have got this gate uh, where it starts. But at Akhre Bank, there is a free car park. From that point, the tarmac lane leads along the river bank to reach the southern end, the, the eastern end of Rock Catherine. And for that point, there are views of Rock Catherine and surrounding features, and also Ben Venue. I have taken photographs of rock faces, cliff faces, reflected in the still waters of that reach of Rock Catherine. The next one, uh, Horia Gromby and Brahire. When the motorist is heading northwards through Calendar past the traffic lights uh, that mark the beginning of the AX1, you will come across a railway signal, indeed a yellow distance signal, parked on the left side. That marks the beginning of the calendar to kill in cycleway. Most of it along X railway track bed. Wheelchair pushable. Now, starting at that point, the wheelchair pushable hiker can proceed along this level track bed, along the um, promontory between. The river, the two rivers conclude, confluing, where the owners map to site of Roman fort to cross the Trossach Road at Kelmahog. Whereupon, the, because of the, neat, the original railway line ducking across on the far side of the river and the bridges, either, or two bridges being dismantled, the Alignment of the trackway is slightly undulating and somewhat stony. This proceeds on the western side of the fold of Lini, a part of Lini, whereupon people like me take most of I have rather too many of those parts. That becomes a uh, Hard packed track at Coria Crumby, where there's another access point and car park, free, fortunately. From that point, a level tarmac road follows the line of the track bed and on to the Forestry Commission, Catherine, with views of from looking northwards. This cycleway has to climb away at a modest gradient for some reason, probably landowner reason. There are uh, reaches of the track bed but the cycleway which are perfectly accessible to ordinary people, but may present difficulties to people in wheelchairs. Uh, this uh, cycleway climbs at a manageable gradient along parallel to the railway line, but 
how many kilometers? I would say three or four kilometers before dipping into Strathire. Now, at all points along that beach, the vistas are so expansive that even the widest angle then cannot pretend the whole vista on to that island. When the flat bed dips down into that island, there will be a glimpse of the Balvan Delta. The best view is to be enjoyed by those who walk up Ben Sheehan and it's visible plainly from the southern end uh, with the, the river Balvag progressively infilling Rock Lubnag so it ends to come ultimately Rock Lubnag will be filled in by uh, what some of us call racial drift, boulder bay washed away from the summit of Ben Sheeran. Now, this highway reaches an extensive car park on the site of Trafford Railway Station. Beyond that point, it has to cross over a side lane by set uh, crosses the river Balvag and a tarmac lane gives onto a farm about 800 meters south. A, si a side lane, tarmac lane, with gates across it, begins at the bridge and follows the very edge of what had once been another lock, with the meanders only visible if you climb Ben Sheehan. This lane passes round the northern edge of Ben Sheehan to bisect a, tar a tarmac lane from Borkwedo Village at a place called Stronis Plainy. Uh, from that point, a steeply rising tarmac lane passes Ballymore at the end of the tarmac to Immeroin, is reached by a farm track that climbs somewhere up the western flank of Ben Sheeran. From that point onwards, there is another path to the summit of Ben Sheeran that bisects the path coming up from Frathaya. And from that point, the normally, the normally endowed hiker finds a steady ascent to the summit town of Ben Sheen, which is about 580 meters above sea level. I have followed the crest line of the ridge northwards by no, no, fairly discernible path to a point where the slope, the northern slope, Towards Porquida <laughs> offers an easy descent back to the road to Spanish Planing. From that point, the geographer can observe features not perceptible to the motorist. Oh, yeah. You will see how the river Balvag has been diverted south. On its present course by the terminal moraine at the place still known as Fort Station, a low ridge but enough to obstruct the passage of the river. So it's obvious to the observer that 
was born in the Ice Age, uh, a river exiting from the west flowed along a geological fault line along the present course of not Earn. Such reversals of river flow can be plotted all over glaciated Britain, including the majestic Severn and even the Thames. Back to your geography lessons, hikers. In the observer sitting on the crest of the ridge can gaze at deltas being formed by glacial till or spoil washed off the slopes of mountains that on the northern side of Loch Boil. So he descends <coughs> that bump sliding to return to his starting point. And at my story, she can make her own way back to Kilmahog. The whiskey funny story about a young a bright spark at uh, Starfield at McLaren High School being paid by his father to tutor uh, a co college daughter in map reading. Too easy. Any more, David Boy? <laughs> well, this is just the beginning. Uh, I, as you yep. yep. uh, I have a whole portfolio of height routes with photographic notes, including uh, a treatise called Handling Elementary Cameras, uh, which includes references to those I bought for 50 pence in the Glasgow Street Market, which I still use, uh, and uh, product photovite, a comprehensive itinerary of photovites in broadly speaking, the product map area with schematic sketch maps, giving details of such matters as hazards, an angle of view, uh, so that if people are as backward and old fashioned as me with film cameras, they can sally forth with me and enjoy edifying days out in the snow line season. So that's another cool part because I can take first rate snow pictures in my a very own garden. I have indeed dozens where I deliberately use low resolution cameras bought for fifty pence and deliberately reloaded throwaway cameras of different types to get monochrome negatives on that ten P or four hundred and enlarge them onto very outdated colour print paper that gives gorgeous shades of pink and gold and scarlet and on another type of outdated paper, brilliant blues and yet another yellow and sepia browns by means of the total darkness RA4 color print process. Now, photographic notes. There are three known sources of film based material now based in England. First call photographic from near Taunton offered a widest range of film based materials uh, monochrome, including obscure foreign mates with weird effects, and you have to pay the asking price to film that costs a third of the price of such high street shops that still exist that stock film based materials. Film for home development. 
And as I said about <laughs> kilometers, they're still on sale in pound size from time to time, 24 exposure, column print stops, 24 to them. Uh, which I developed myself. Made alternative, by, alternatively, where could people get the color films pr processed? Now, it is decades since I entrusted uh, any films to any firm except for process paid. Uh, <laughs> film as Christmas presents. Yes. Now, as digital photography has ruthlessly supplanted color at uh, 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 film photography, I must warn everybody of a grim message about a year ago by the deputy editor of the amateur photographer, no less. He is the father of two trapping sons. It, uh, when his elder son was both draft, he used 35 millimeter film, and his negatives of the boy are utterly permanent. When his younger son was born, he used digital, and found to his horror that before the boy and a baby came of age, Everything to do with the taking and recording and printing out of images will become an obsolete and half crown. The camera will be chucked away, but while the thing in place of film the using will be un and faded beyond recovery, and the means of printing it out would be but obviously it's half crap. So this man sent the digital watch it to the Somerset firm to be put onto 35 millimeter film. So that when this man's son is of age, and perhaps himself a father, he has a record of his childhood. So the Boy would be presented one of his dad's old but serviceable pentaxes or such like to photograph his sports days and things like that. To be sure that when the boy became a father, there is him, like as before, in his cricket whites or in his graduation gown. But were the public to lose? Every trace of every image done on digital cameras of anything personally important to them, they, the whole nation would lose. So the, this is the fundamental drawback of digital photography is the fact that it is a hype forced on the public by multinational companies to force John of the market square to buy brand new equipment that lasts five years only and no longer. Whereas I, David Seagrave, own and use the camera, my 21st birthday camera, which it was made in 1958 and give print, if I want to, 45 by 30 centimeters. Because I made selective enlargements down the decades uh, of black and white to prove its definition and resolve it does. Likewise, whatever it is, slide, color print, or black and white, I get prints far bigger than I can use. I'm using the right kind of film, I do. And likewise, 
other film cameras given to me, you would easily start results. And that leads to matters rather outside his talk about the ultimate fate of my burgeoning archive of negatives and slides. But uh, there is intrinsic satisfaction for mastering all stages of film photography, and whereas using a digital camera is a, a satisfying and tying one's shoelaces. You press the button, that's it. But the discipline of working in total darkness and intrinsic satisfaction of a higher kind of test. The more anybody struggles to master a difficult technique of any kind, the more he creates himself. Because a man is not just a body. We are the most advanced entities that so far evolved. And when we set about mastering any worthwhile discipline of any kind, we create ourselves. So this is philosophy outside the discipline of photography, but photography has a great deal uh, to make to for people to experience higher realities through the discipline of mastering photography. Uh, any more commentary, please, Alex? Hmm. So, I know that uh, we've had various conversations over time about uh, loneliness yeah. and uh, what what we can do to uh, to combat this. Now, I, I I know that you're a very creative thinker and. Personally, I find writing and thinking and reading and doing something creative helps me uh, when I'm feeling lonely. Yeah, yeah. What would your advice be for people who are facing a period where they're real lonely? Well, if I had to me. And were able to communicate. I would put appeals in local papers, preferably, fear of treading on certain people's toes, and people to join me in initial gathering at a convenient place. Either Dunfermline or Edinburgh, and carry out what I call a Socratic induction. But dare I say it, in suitable weather, to get people to meet me at a suitable rendezvous point, such as Edinburgh bus station, and proceed to. Hollywood Park. And then I would say it uh, on a fine day, but not on a teeming wet day or freezing day, which is Haggis now. Now, uh, that is a completely accessible spot. The particular spot in Hollywood Park where they're is looking in the right direction with nothing man made in sight. Only the vistas of Arthur Seat, another possible venue which is very appropriate, is to go up Colton Hill, in fact, my present infirmities. And there's a spot, there's a precise spot on Colton Hill where I would sit on a convenient seat, look across to Hollywood Park. And there's a vista of the whole park uh, in that one direction only, with nothing man-made in sight. 
uh, other adoptions, as I say, would take place in the shade of the National Monument, which is, of course, inspired by the Temple of Olympian Zeus in Central Athens. I, I won't remember talking about my profile of that famous monument in Athens, that we would reenact the dialogues, the adoptions of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. In fact, I had rather overambitious designs to organize uh, events at the National Monument, which were successors to the dialogues in Plato's famous books. So all and sundry would gather by the monument and people would come and talk about the current affairs of our day as Socrates, Plato and Aristotle did of their day. But nailing it down that people have intense private hurts to find beauty spots where people can gather and be calmed by the melodies of winds and waves and the aromas of the sea. Well, we have hardly too many of them. I can name places at North Berwick and St. Andrews and much closer at hand where people could allow the resonance of the Almighty to flow into their uh, minds. Perhaps people in the direst mental distress might gather and flint and sit in silence as Quentin do and let the spirit of the place flow into them and then one might speak that each in turn as Quentin do or said to do which is those that innermost hurts and you understand that if people in dire mental stress made a practice of setting aside the Lord's Day, not for groveling before a priest, but for contemplation of beauty, and whether what I say is true or only susceptible to certain kinds of people, it is the presence of the place that floweth into a her human soul. I say, I insist that the country either side of the A82 possesses me. Whenever I travel through those parks, I feel that it flows into me, leaving Barak for Balahoonish, all the places on the way flow into me and I insist that I undergo delightful phenomena which can be roughly defined as a kind of silent music, a melody, a harmony beyond normal human perception which so flows into me that I become no longer a human being but a greater totality. I try to express this in different works. In Ben Scullard, a poem I wrote in quite dire mental distress, in time of sorrow, I begin. I was brought under torment to Bassett in the far of time before your kind evolved your mind. My rocks are spilling down 
prefix something to my girding sea. Purposeful little rhyming creature, I have need of thee. See of the Almighty, here dissolving into a greater totality, be thou my guardian, my friend, beg to keep me holy, do as a driven snow, save me homeward, <laughs> go to throng and agora where thy brethren meet and to them speak. <laughs> Stand firm upon my topmost crag, who went to evil sores, survey and understand what forces make form the land. Behold the town shadows race across my apple's moors. Be pilgrims returning, all voices blending, enjoy never ending. That expresses what I feel. Because I, my last resting place, will be at the foot of fence colored, and that color of mine on a flat on its summit, so that in hope beyond hope, desperate hope, if I am ever reincarnated, the sturdier limbs of brighter frame, I will be instantly drawn to Scotland. Had I written already in a story called A Flight to Turkey, written, that it said, in an aeroplane on its way to Turkey, I expressed the idea that as a reward for my struggle to live a righteous life, not in the Christian sense, but the Aristotelian sense, I will be regarded in a certain theology as a first rate invent for God, in that in my struggle to live according to principles of reason out and contribute to the common good by all the means I have at my disposal, I will. Return to Earth as somebody else. In my story thread, to spoil the box somewhat, I appear as a lecturer at Vatican University, the party of students heading for Dun Craig, at which the mansion on here part of the hall. Now, uh, um, resource center for foreign students from landlocked countries. And these children from Chemnitz, who've never seen the sea in their lives, are coming with me to enjoy what the Highlands can provide. And as I pass through Cumberland of a happy memory, I have a fleeting far memory of living there in the reign of Elizabeth VII on those trains. And as I travel northwards with my party at places like Perth, I have these far memories of being somebody else, a man named David Seagrave. So we reach Duncray. It's a wet day, and I spill all the beans to my fellow students because. And in this earthly life, I've mastered German as a schoolboy at Red Hill School in 1958. So, in the next life, I'm drawn to a natural aptitude for German. And in lucid dreams, I dream of a country far from Ludlow where I was born in the next life with odd names like Christian Law and such like. I have the memories of being somewhere else, a country called Christian Law, where it's very wild, with snow capped mountains and two 
railway lines, crops, one by a high viaduct and a station. Uh, this place is a sparsely populated country uh, served by railways and uh, this place, Crystal Mark, is important to me somehow. I come from a city somewhere to the south and I know every mountain. I've been at every one. It, this place is part of me -ness. I reach my train or by a funny or find myself moving along a road to try to something that propels me to the open air at a modest speed and I know everywhere I want on this red and white thing with wheels. I in the lucid dream I I was riding vehicle I passed through Krishna to other places with odd names. I think this country is Canada. The and that the is a part of Canada because these are the Rocky Mountains. It's all garbled up with other names the syllables in the wrong order and <laughs> of the city with a building like a huge church with a clock tower, a long narrow building with a huge clock tower which is very familiar to me. It's on a hilltop overlooking uh, a wide river and beyond lies a thriving city and it's very important to me. These scrambled up lucid dreams and are places that are rather blurred beyond blessed. Another city some way to the east uh, with a castle on a hilltop and a miniature mountain range at the foot of that hilltop stretches a wilderness of jagged mountains with names not in English but some other names of the Aboriginal language and of even vaguer ghostly images of places uh, reached by aeroplane like Athens it's readily identified because of its monuments and I deduce that I was just somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I make this company that I was just somebody else. <laughs> when I meet a young lady from Flat Frisia and make an attachment to her, her name might be Heidi. And we are very attached to one another. And we go northwards. And then I'm in this country, Scotland, and little by little it all comes back. I wanted somebody else. Oh, and this somebody else-ness, I always wore riding breeches. <laughs> and there was something horrible below my right knee. Something was missing. And then... I find more abundant food to discover that I was a boat called David Seaway. And that is since when I climbed that mountain and everything is familiar from the summit. I have been here before this. The vista from the summit of the islands and skerries and inlets and adjacent peaks. So I descend the mountain, I go to a library and discover precisely who I was and download so much more of the writing of this book, Seagrave, that it clicks. And my destiny is to carry on where Seagrave left off. I am the eternal soul who has returned to Earth. Uh, and that when I cross, cross Seagrave works, by accident or divine design, it reverberates 
I agree with his philosophy, his contributionism. It makes better sense than Christianity and Judaism, and certainly more sense than Islam. And so I forge ahead and become a lecturer with the name of David Woodymere. That in the story line. That is the story I wrote on a flight to Turkey, which I called a flight to Turkey. <laughs> See? So I would have shattered the veil of mortality and know that in life after life, by <coughs> applying Seagrave philosophy, I will evolve with still synthetic human bodies, but to a mental state beyond the understanding of the man talking to you. And this is the ultimate destiny of mankind. Uh, if there's any hope in that, uh, as I've written already, Alex, about mankind settling on the moon, Mars, in habitat satellites called Ramas, was described by the inventor Arthur C. Clarke, and ultimately exoplanets. As in my little story, The Sacred Melodies of Old Earth, the ultimate destiny of the human species can only surely to be to evolve into evolve into sentient beings as diverse as the fish in the sea so that sentient beings who praise God by writing poetry and music on habitats a diverse from us two as the mackerel art from the shark, in morphologically adapted to the exigencies of life on exoplanets. Exoplanets. Uh, you understand? Yep. But all bearing our surnames and traditions and cultural cultures blended together as Adam Wright's Protonates do, and of the blending of, of bloods. Now, I've been working, as you may know already, on uh, Alan Wright's first trip abroad. Now, do you know much about Belgium? Well, a little bit. They are wonderful with textiles. Right. They've got a long tradition of. Uh, uh, chocolate. Maybe. Yeah, right. Do uh, you know the poem How They Brought the Good News from Ball to A? Do you remember it? No. No. Now, that will think. <laughs> Coming together. Now, remember the open nights about three horsemen who set out from Ball to A. Uh, the poem was written when Browning was on board the ship bound for Trieste with his wife when they settled there. A date line is apparently uh, about the time of the accession of Queen Victoria. And we never know what the good news was that the three horsemen were taking from Gong to A. Now, in actual fact, I and my family travelled from Dieppe to Brussels and on across Belgium to Germany by way of a little bit of the Netherlands at Maastricht and so on to Cologne and down the Rhine Valley and to beyond Mites where Alan Wright's people stay. So I have Alan's father wanting to go to a church conference in Mites. And Alan 
teachings of German that I did, and then teaching his classmate German, and learning how to swear in German. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, Alan set forth, and it's all ready to be printed out. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been working on it line by line, paragraph by paragraph, exposing, expunging silly mistakes to a coherent plot, which includes wicked passages, including a very funny episode where Alan's father gets his abroad and drives the family car into a ditch in Flanders. That is hilarious. And repercussion, that's a sideline. But Alan, I met an outrageous, well, already created Bloomstein. He's a true real people. <laughs> the eminent Jewish educationalist, Bruno Bettelheim, escaped the Nazis, emigrated to America, and set up red hole type remedial school in the United States for children with psychiatric problems. He also wrote the momentous book, Children of the Dream, which described the kibbutzim and the impact upon the children brought up in collective families, which greatly impressed me. Leonard Boom apparently went to school with Otto Shaw. He was Jewish and was connected in some way with Bethlehem. So these people, real people, coalesced to become Benny Blumstein, who we learn escaped the Nazis, uh, emigrated, his family went to New York, got uh, to uh, become a psychiatric physician, and started to set up remedial schools backed by various benevolent authorities. And he comes to school quite often, and he's impressed by Adam's evil magician, and they get to know one another sufficiently well. Boomstein had two winsome daughters who played remote part in the story. So, <laughs> Boomstein is taking a party of London school children from his own school in or near London to Brussels. Well, there. Adam has read, understood, and enjoyed poem about the horseman and find an atlas. See, if I could contrive things that dad takes a wrong turn in a meal, we'll end up in bond. Then we could follow the horseman route all the way to A. I, so he talked over with Bloomstein. Yes. What a brilliant idea, Alan. We'll do the same. Are you were telling me about your stupid father and even stupid mother. Well, we will arrange to for the same ship. So you might meet me on the lawn on the morning sailing. Yeah. I'll be glad for your company, Alan. So the story rolls on. So there we go. Well, I won't spoil the plot in that respect, but I've already written the relevant chapters where <laughs> Arthur, Adam's father, has been swigging beer on the channel steamer, and Adam has spotted beer bottles at his father's table. Meanwhile, he didn't waste the voyage, he was eyes down with guidebooks and writing itineraries in his italic script to share with his hopeful companion. So off they set. Adam pilots the car out of the air. On they go northwards. The father, uh, somewhat the worse for drink, it's lost in meal. Adam <laughs> notices he's taking the gauntlet, not the brush. And then comes the incident at the roundabout, where he asks goes the wrong way around, narrowly misses a head on crash, and then stuck in the ditch, with the cars rump high in the air, and then leaping out dry shard, rescuing the other occupants, along come Benny's bus. Hi, Alan. 
togetherness Arthur there. And I, 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 Benny said to Arthur, we'll get you out of a jam. You're in a sorry pickle here. Over the hill lies gone. Hold tight. Alan is coming with me. And so off they go. And so the car is dumped in the garage and gone. And off go Alan's family to stay the night in gone. And they follow the line of the horsemen. They arrive as they get the place names. Uh, Lutheran, Boom, Dufel, Makelin, Airshot, Assault, Blues, Congeran, and finally, not a little place, Dalham. All the stopping places named in the poem, where all Benny's pupils, well, they, they start, of course, with Gong, and they recite the initial stanzas. Then it's set off for the, at Lutheran, they recite that standard, <laughs> and so all stopped to a triumphant arrival in Arkham, where everybody gathers to recite the final standard. It's been filmed by Benny and photographed by Alan with his still cameras. So they arrive in triumph at Aachen. And so on they go to Cologne and down the Rhine Valley with Alan giving an erudite commentary and stopping wherever it is nice to snap. All the way to Mites, where Arthur might act stupid. That's another chapter. But one important stop is Bacharach, where an already written chapter, the hilarious episode on the Rhine steamer flying almost as frequent as buses up the Rhine, all the way from Cologne to Mites. And that's really funny, with the title, You see how much all my family are quite mad. That's the title of that chapter. Well, it hit me in the face. Why not? Remember, what was the good news that was brought from Gone to A? Surely, the ideal that all the young ch the, the children of the respected United Europe cycle the route taken by the horsemen and perhaps stay the night in each stopping place in this list. They, Europe's pride and joy, are the good news. The hope of the future. Now, the Tour de France, I think, is a competitive event. This isn't. It's just what I would call an affirmation of our common humanity, a contributionist life affirmation. I propose to Valerie that every Easter, <laughs> cyclists from the European States assemble at Gaulle to take part in a, a cycle, a cycle ride following the route of Browning's horse, then stopping at focus intervals. This is 170 kilometers. In saying so, Browning. And made an unsettled howler, those three horsemen could not have actually gone from Gaunt to A in a, a day and a night because it's too far for a horse to gallop. No wonder two horses died on the way. But what an opportunity. From what I produce here in the list. The places on the way aren't particularly beautiful. So if 
This was instituted every Easter with an appropriate time allowance for all but teenage and slightly older participants to pedal comfortably from place to place. Throughout the Easter holiday, year in, year out, this would take place at the Tour de France. And the vast throngs of people from Belgium and far beyond would line the streets of every stopping point to view the sightless peddling along, and at every stopping place, the throngs would gather in the market square to recite the poem by Browning with one voice, and then at Aachen there would be further celebrations of the life of Robert Browning, and then they would go their separate ways wherever they wanted to go. So every year, you are in, out, the grotty places, like what was it here, brick making, duffel coats, uh, furniture making, uh, uh, railway workshops, and so on, not particularly interesting places, would acquire revenue from bed and breakfast accommodation uh, as people came to enjoy the spectacle. And thus, it would be like, well, the strict consequences, Alex, would only be that those right in the industrial towns get this extra money, become the international event, and so to Alan Wright uh, in his world, being a kingpin in organising this year in, year out, until this year, Alan like me is coming in first. And it is, the, the story yet to be written is, is going on its last ever tour leader guide, uh, the tour leader of the satellite. It starts necessarily in Gaul, it ends at Aachen, and as he passes through each place in turn, going slower now, because the only in a van with, uh, well, the driver, with a whacking rate mirror, uh, a tall and double deck bus, so that he can watch over oh, yeah. the people at the back. That's the head of the procession. They amble along at bicycle speeds with gaps in the traffic between national contingencies so that eastbound motorists can park, go, proceed without that or hindrance. So uh, the convoy pulls into designated passing bays wherever necessary, uh, they rise along the highway linking these cities so that the ordinary traffic can pass without let or hindrance. Uh, but the cyclists rest at every passing bay. They can spend as long as they need to go 170 kilometers as an event to arrive in Arthur for a grand celebration. And then they go their separate ways. So that idea of international brotherhood or fellowship should be adopted. And then by extension, other countries stage similar events during the tourist season where, uh, for example, uh, young people from landlocked countries enjoy coastal rides in Derek said, Bonnie, in Scotland. So you could imagine a similar ride for deliberately arranged for children from Hungary, Austria, and Switzerland, but such like countries uh, who would enjoy seaside uh, or the distinctive scenery 
of a nice country like Scotland. And so the ideal of international fellowship. I've already written a story for the old Bridget Davion. Did you get it? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, uh, I will send it to you. When, when would that have been? Uh, well, when I wrote it about two or three years ago. Ah, uh, it, my memory is not terribly good with names. Well, the old bridge at Davion is about uh, what you call a contributionist life affirmation at New Year's Eve with the whole international gathering linking hands at this just before the wishing hour and singing all that sign. I'm exceedingly proud of it, but it might be very hard for the reader to twig what it's all about. A clue. Many, in many languages, you see, uh, we have alternative names for the country's capital. Like, Pram is Praha, and we have uh, uh, but Frenchman London is Rondra, and wherever any language has inflective endings uh, which are not present in say English, then the name may bear a syllable. Uh, which is not the initial letter of the name on the gazetteer. They give the proof. Davion. Uh, the misheard name with some official. D A D Y O N. And it, and it assonates with a mispronounce. First, my forename, David. David, do you understand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, it's a play of these words, the name of Davion. <coughs> and it's all about international fellowship. And I don't want to spoil the plot, but <coughs> well, well, I better spoil the plot. Uh, now, remember... Some cities have nursery rhymes or uh, songs that are signature to. Now, London has several, like oranges and lemons, refer to London's churches, doesn't it? Yep. The bells of St. Clement's and all these London churches ring bells. So that's a London signature. Yes. Other cities have signatures. Now, quite by chance, when 30 or 40 years ago, I was writing about a fellow called Thomas Delaray, who has a tragic background, where he comes to Roman Bridge, for his eponymous Roman Bridge, a fictional city, and its cathedral tower has a Galloway clock made by Christopher Galloway of Down the Road in Haddington. Like Vasky clock in Moscow is a Galloway clock. And that Galloway clock plays all people that on earth do dwell. Poor Tom hears the words all people who in church do smell. Like you, Thomas <laughs> Galloway. The tormenting cathedral shine. But that into as uh, an allegory, absolutely everybody who would ever live forevermore. That is Roman British signature. So each city might have its signature, mm -hmm. and children master it. So when the international gatherings. Deputation of 
senior approval, pray with City's signature tune, uh, uh, to introduce themselves. They might sing the open stanza. So every city ought to have a dignified signature tune. Now, but confirming the king sits in and firmly to drinking the red wine, red wine, object. If there's no tune, then somebody else might be commissioned to compose one. So international fellowships would bring the nation together, the young people who would dance together, play music, uh, it often gets to know one another better and marry one another when they are of age and graduating. So a Europe of blended bloods with people with mixed names like Alastair Krugelman, half German, half Scots, and blended bloods from other nations, Dutch, Spanish, simply citizens of one country, the wide planet, us. You understand? Now, Very if it was carefully cultivated, then ultimately the world will be a fellowship of simply God's sons and daughters. You understand? And nothing more, nothing less. But there are barriers, and it would take would take generations. And in the United States, stop and think about the blended lots of. The United States. It may be far fetched, but necessary for mankind survival. Otherwise, as Martin Luther King said, men must live, learn to live as brothers, otherwise, we will die together as fools. And an illustrious Polish Jew, John Stockway, had the solution Esperanto. Now, the tragedy is that he was. So far ahead of his time, especially with the typewriter, that his invention never caught on. Because Esperanto, as you doubtless know, has more letters than the thirty. That is its chief drawback. Because you cannot type Esperanto on a thirty ball. Though typewriters have be invented with far better arrangements than QWERTY, those who master them are so accustomed to the better arrangements that they cannot go back to a QWERTY because they can type three times as fast on the Moltron or the Borjac yeah. than the QWERTY. Yeah. Now, Borjac was obviously a check. B, B, O, R with an R, hat, accent, A, Accent K or something like that. Now, as I have explored in my stories about the hexadacts, who have their own 36 letter phonetic alphabet, it's a hexadactic and 12 neural symbols, their keyboards would be like Porter and uh, Moldfarm. Now, when they arrive on Earth, and all these perfect serviceable uh, uh, computers and what have you with working and they're stuck because they can't spell their language on QWERTY but they're stuck with them they haven't enough no. uh, hexadactic uh, machines brought from their home planet. But countless thousands of serviceable QWERTY uh, keyboards on computers, millions indeed, that we earth would have left behind when we died out. So that was the thing that puzzled how to round it. One, but it takes manpower to modify every computer it's still in use to have uh, other than 30. That was my Paul Zamenhof's invention 
didn't take arms. The labor cost of adding accents to QWERTY script is so costly that in terms of girls going through any document word by word, putting in the hat accents, it's like you see, how uh, can I say it? Uh, the rules of spelling, language by language. And why reformed spelling cannot ever be adopted. A simple reason for that is that if everything was written in reformed spelling, then two generations, hardly anybody will be able to read everything in the unreformed spelling. So, so much of the world literature, even the Johnny Old Bible, will be in the reformed because of the labor costs involved in transliterating old to new spellings of common words. So, it can only be forevermore. Language traps in every nation. A T E H E I R in T H E R E and in the spelling of our very own names. And people rightly resent being told to spell their names a different way. So it all boils down to any alteration requiring manpower, time. If uh, I get irritated by computer aids, by the nonsense of capital letters in the middle of words, and though the deliberate use of a capital means something like it governed by the syllable before, like belonging to, or by a preposition. Uh, so whenever I come across an Americanism, like one note with a capital N in the middle of the word, it refers, does, it automatically clicks. It, the N in the capital is deliberate because it is signified a concept like uh, prepositional or governed by the part of speech O and E before it. But what is it governed by? Is, does it mean say that the N becomes a T if it is governed by the possessive case? My mind goes berserk. It jams. Do you understand? Now, I understand enough of Latin to understand the principle. And in French and German, uh, syllable inflects, or even face names inflect. In Slavic languages, it's all the time. So you have, why no trains to Prague on this timetable? But lots of trains are going to a place called P R I A Z E, phrase. A P R A Z E is a tiny village in Cornwall on the Helston Plant Line. How the hell are trains in Bohemia going to Cornwall? Then it dawns on me. P R A Z E is the uh, inflected form of P R A H A. You understand? You understand? No, that is a barrier to all people that uh, uh, do well. Mastering languages. There's no language which has the same properties as Esperanto that ever been invented that's quirky spellable with only 16 rules of grammar as in Esperanto. What, what do you think of uh, shorthand? Well, I know of it, but I have only a slight inkling of it. But considering how the random evolution of European, or every language, creeps so that 
old words are ditched and new neologisms are invented, especially in things like computers, that we have to come to terms with words that appear a T E C H is an ugly neologism which I hate. I like I like words derived from classical languages. So of course tech is actually the reason of the Greek technique skill. But when a word is corrupted, but the horrible case yes. of computer and commuter both great on my mind. Now, to compute is surely the mental arrestment. I compute when I say this table is 150 by 90. And the area, 59, my lines are 45.99, that is 1.35 square meters, area, compute, <laughs> estimate. Commute means originally reduce the severity of, like commute a death sentence, not travel from A to B. So I would say, not commuter train, but work train. You see? Uh, I would use plain old fashioned English. I would expand, I would expand commute from the dictionary. It's so readily mixed up with compute, you see, and can do so with disaster content. I would, but when I invent the origin of like my sad little one, Mindquake, is a self-evident neologism. Earthquake, mindquake, something that happens in anybody's head. You see, yeah. when I coin endio fact, in God make, with yeah. reference to endio fact, e n d e o f a c t. Now I coined it. On a jolting train after seeing a very remarkable man for the last time ever. Roy Green was blind and in a wheelchair, yet he was a high ranking uh, psychologist whose job with Birmingham City Council was to care for severely emotionally disturbed children as a consultant. And he was the most remarkable man I ever met. He was born in 49, same age as my sister, and he died young of bowel cancer. And I mourned him. So I wrote a story about a man who was obviously him, with a different name, Mike Meeching. The uh, story was called, Why Must the Righteous Perish? Roy Green, in Christ's term, he was entrusted with a talent, a gold, a silver bar. He did not spend it, nor did he did not lose it, nor did he spend it. Well, the servant in the parable returned two gold bars to his maker of account. Roy Green gave back to his maker with a capital M a lorry of gold bars. You see what I mean? He gave much more. <laughs> Each. A shining investment for God and mankind. He was a paradigm. The gold we must crawl skywards to. His royal service freely given his endure back. No trace for him the memory of that royal service. There were others like him. Equal investment for God. Though 
confined to wheelchairs and living in strain lines in Cheshire homes. But they gave of themselves. They taught me what is God. And I must reiterate about a Jewish gentleman I met in Woodley Mental Hospital in 1973. I repeat what, what happened. I had left my Catholic landlady's lodging house soon after graduation to find a mountain in Glencoe. So waited in Bradford Great Western Road for a bus to Glencoe. I was set upon by two men who grabbed me and forced me into a police car, dumped me in a police cell in part of the police station, then driven without any explanation, no explanation for the arrest per se, and to why I was at the Woodley Mental Hospital. Then dumped in a war, given an injection, dumped into a war. There I met Cohen, and we talked. He told me he was Jewish, he had cerebral palsy, and his ambition was to pray at the wedding wall in the Jerusalem. And he'd been ill-treated in Woodley Hospital, and I can't remember all his circumstances, but he'd definitely been savagely ill-treated by being incarcerated in the hospital against his will, where he <coughs> had nothing to, nothing to do, he said. Well, nothing to do. And he taught me what was God. He was a manifestation of God. But the courage he showed, he was incandescence, present of the Almighty, gushing out of that heresy deformed, several important body. But when I was made, I met others with different disabilities. I perceived God in them. I got to know of a certain Paul Hunt of Odeon Way with uh, uh, degeneration of the muscle, muscular dystrophy, who wrote a systematic and thorough sociology of disability. <laughs> A fit point. He molded me to Paul Hunt. I read it, I understood it, I acted upon it. I reduced it finding to Paul Hunt's legacy. Typewritten, it's there for you to incorporate into your website. A systematic and thorough <laughs> sociology. And my analysis of Hunt's predicament and the relationship of people with disabilities to the ordinary run of people and especially toward uh, people in charge of society. A sociological analysis. Now, other people I met in London uh, when I was in my staffing years produced in from the cold, entirely produced by people with different disabilities. I had a small contribution and we met Roy and other followers who I left for Cumberland once a month at premises in the south of Birmingham. So on their behalf, I wrote a systematic and thorough account of the Birmingham canals for the boat canal crews. So I wrote a lot of it, including maps of Birmingham and adjacent areas, as a systematic history of the Birmingham Canal, 200 miles of them. And it was avidly read to Roy Green uh, by members of the party, and he went on the canal cruise. So that I have for republication. But anybody who wants to go cruising down Birmingham Canal Web, 200 miles of it. Uh, if it you're an industrial archaeologist, it's your seventh heaven to view all the uh, industrial monuments of Greater Birmingham. So, <laughs> I mustn't go down this particular Asperger branch line, but so, any more questions you might care to answer, ask me. Do go ahead.
I'm enjoying every moment. Yes, well, well uh, it, it's, it's, it's a pleasure hearing your philosophy, you know. You, 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 are, you take such a lot of time to think about things and write things down. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, an inspiration that, you know, to, to meet somebody so creative. Thank you. And, and that your desire is to contribute to the world. Um, no, and your your philosophy of contributionism. Yes, has always. Oh, I got something very sad to tell you. Uh -huh. I googled the name contributionism. Yeah, and found that a uh, cranky South African called Michael Tellinger <laughs> has hijacked the name. Right. Now I deduced that he invented it. He. <laughs> uh, he has a delusion that a worldwide society can be established without money. He is, I would call him as a pernicious crank. He <laughs> contacted some mayor of some Canadian city in French Canada who wants a doctor. Basically, he wants He's going on a tour of the German speaking country at this minute. Expensive. <laughs> charging enormous sums. So this doesn't, his, his philosophy doesn't chime with your Definitely philosophy. Definitely not. He has a delusion. Starting with his Canadian city, it's called Frontenac. Somewhere in French Canada, I will let find it on a map. When a mayor will if the mayor called for it, set up a money-free economy in Canadian city. I don't know how big it is or where it is, and there would be no money. Now, telling to believe that money is the root of all evil, but he has a delusion that we can do without it. Now, in history, remember, now, Remember the monks. Now, back in the Middle Ages, when the Christianity spread, or probably got by the monks, of course, uh, the Danes had way place to Yorkshire and adjacent counties. So the monasteries, you can go and visit them, everyone. They basically, the monasteries had a very important role in medieval society to find employment for physically unfit people, men who could not be soldiers. So they had their self-sufficient estates where they raised sheep, wool, and all manner of agricultural things, and water mills, and basically Machinery driven by renewable power, wind and water, and they flourished, spreading the gospel. And they left a mark, but they had to pay taxes to Rome, so they taxed. Now, far far black sheep have you any wool? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three black wool. One for the master, one for the dame, and one for the little boy who lived down the lane. One for the master, the owner of the estate or the abbot. One for the day, Virgin Mary, Rome, bales of wool, money, yes, money, carried by pack horses, durable, useful, turned into fast, all the way from Yorkshire to Rome, and therefore textile mills to clothe the monks or wherever. Now, money, yes, money, not bags of gold and sovereigns, but wool. So, but fast forward to the Industrial Revolution. Well, Christ Day, gold, silver, and copper. Go to the museum down the road, money museum, to learn all about it. Money. Ooh. Other forms of money included wives in backward countries like Islamic countries. I'll, I'll pay you my third wife for that herd of cattle. Cattle, always money, chattels, 
cattle. So, uh, you see, money. Brit Britain was very backward as well. So uh, I mean, yeah. So money. So go to the museum and all about money. You enjoy it till folding time. Money. <laughs> that no advanced society that ever existed that dispensed with money. There were short lived half baked experiments, some led by uh, eminent men who didn't have the intelligence to reason out the strict consequences of doing without money. So, supposing that, and I told this man to his face, that was any city, province, or sovereign state that did away with money, according to your facts. Within days of it being published in the world press, all the crooks and opportunities from far and wide would enter that city, province, or country and strip it of its assets. We can take as many cattle, or sheep, primitive days, or goods of high street shops. It's no price. So fancy a roll, fancy a diamond ring, take it away. It would collapse into chaos within days. Oh. And so the hapless, ordinary people so of you, that. You feel the uh, 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 bartering system has no place or some place in the world? Well, bartering, you see, his contradiction is based upon uh, arrangements in some unspecified part of Africa where they have had long established communitarian, communitarian yeah. uh, societies who might be somewhat akin to medieval monasteries. Uh, uh, essentially evolved from the exigencies of survival in that particular part of Africa with its climatic endowment and therefore what can be grown at uh, all the available resources in that given area which determine the lifestyle of everybody who lives there. Right. Not necessarily Europeans, but the Aboriginal people from the start. Don't the Aborigines and savages. The indigenous Aboriginal people of Africa have evolved their lifestyles in accordance with the limitations imposed by climate, vegetation, and seasonal events like monsoons. They were, the European state. And they were very much more in touch with the world. Yes, right? absolutely. So, however, with the advance of science, uh, inventions like the internet, obviously, the world is becoming so increasingly interconnected that there's hardly any place in the entire world that is not connected yet to the world itself. The Andaman Islands featured in a recent tragedy where a missionary was killed by the Andamanians. He went out with the best Christian intent and then he went missing. And then it was discovered that he'd been put to death in a disgusting manner by some of the Andamanians. So an American group Managed the perilous voyage through these remote islands, technically part of India, where the Indian authorities have a yearly ship. Well, they get the utmost difficulty to get to these islands, you know, like St. Kilda, only accessible uh, when it's calm, but in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So it featured in the newspapers. And so uh, they are about the only people left who are not yet connected. To the wide world. Uh, so, as the world is being especially upset at the social storms, when well a hurricane, actual hurricanes, social equivalent of hurricanes, when 
war strikes, uh, like the endemic war between Shias and Sunnis, we, the world is really under successive blows inflicted by one another. And a horrible report in the London Times about refugees threatening the welfare of a Greek island and it's all across a kilometre wide strait to to uh, refugee camp but they're spreading they're spreading cholera now I've foreseen this in horror stories <laughs> and I read it in yesterday's London Times about <laughs> Children dying of cholera, worst cholera epidemic ever recorded in history. To be quite blunt, uh, experimental, the crops experimentally transmitted. So, in grim reality, the administrator of this Greek island have a choice. Are the local residents to die of cholera? Spread by the excremental practices of the refugees, or are we going to elbow out the refugees? Quite bluntly, that's what the administrative Greeks have to deal with right now. I mean, do you understand you, that? Do you not think that this is because? Uh, Populations are made to live in squalor that disease comes about. Well, uh, rather than uh, it being in, you know, disease being a part of a population. Well, you see, it, when in history the Spaniards invaded South America, each lot killed one another off because each lot had immunity to diseases that caused the other lot, invaders or avenues to die. So syphilis spread around the world when Europeans arrived in the Caribbean, because the document of course. Uh, the residents of the Americas had the germ, but they were immune to it. The Europeans had them. So when the Europeans, starting with Christopher Columbus, landed on in America, they uh, fornicated and then they got syphilis. So it spread like wildfire into the German boat, invented, discovered a substance that cured it. it it was known as 606 because it was in 606 substance he tried out on sympathetic people. He was an eminent man like Guy de Maupassant, who died of it. Guy de Maupassant used brothel, historically documented. All the remedies, what it did to you in those days, now it's kept under precariously under control. Now, whereas the bubonic plague advanced across Europe by bubonic people advancing a few kilometers a day across Europe, uh, and so to cope with the document is back then. Now, that was a year or so for two years, maybe, or even longer, for the bubonic plague to reach Britain and all the posts documented about the backlash in Britain. Uh, nowadays, if some mutation were to arise, which, uh, a link between climate, Monkey like beings and humans, or even birds and humans, or even 
chickens in here. That sounds me to be a diesel disease. A, a diesel disease from animals to people always cut it open. Do you want me to put those in a tinfoil? Yeah, yeah. No, they're not the chocolate. No, they're not the Well, you see, now, I've already written a story on precisely what happened. Yes. Ebola comes to mind as other diseases that mastered symptoms. Somebody contracts it from an animal about its lawful business somewhere in a remote place. Like a missionary goes out to Barthamba to do the gospel thing and breathes germs from some guttling creature in the forest, gets something misdiagnosed and flu, but it isn't. He borns a Boeing home to Bonnie Scotland and doesn't know that he has got lethal symptoms. As in the story about the plain due to have it to MOT at Freshwick. The, the, the perfectly airworthy plain, one of many which Britain is forced to overseas. And it has to have an aerial MOT. Uh, so in order to carry flying from A to B in where it flies to. And so off go and through, we go out and fly it, and they're taken ill on the flight. They don't know that. In the very aeroplane, there are germs lurking, which is going to and fro, to and fro, and absorbing these germs, which are invisible. There are passengers or little creatures that small, who suck into the plane and uh, lay eggs or whatever, do what they do. Though the plane is our sense of flying as it may tend some creature is perhaps nested in the plane between flights, and the germs are not being invisible, so the crew can inhale the germs, and off it flies, taking, taking days to get to Scotland. And so all of a sudden, all the crew fell ill. They're really, really vile. And the plane had just enough fuel to get to Bradshaw. So they put down the plane in shallow water at the Strathclyde Lock, uh, which is an artificial water body near Motherwell. On a hot day, uh, they read it, we are all putting oh, and putting this plane down in the lock in shallow water. So down it comes with a splash, like the plane that landed on the Hudson River. They know that it can be used as an emergency landing site. There are other planes in different have landed on the track by block. The pressure water is long enough for the plane landing in the natural shadow water. So along comes the metric squad. Oh, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not in any. What would you, well, what, your, what are your plans? It's 20 to 5. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we're going to have to go around the corner. Yeah. 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 So what happens is in the storyline, the narrator is to do with aeroplanes. Uh, now, the rest of the world open the door and find five dead men in the plane. Out come the germs on a heated hot day to multiply like bilio in Motherwell. People think it's flu. The five corpses are taken through post mortem examination, but the germs are flooded Motherwell. People are dying like flies. But people think flu, go to your GP. But the germs multiply like bilio on a hot August day. People go about the business of boxing the compass and suddenly within a week, half of Scotland is done with it, whatever it is, and dying of it. Along comes our hero in Canada, uh, related to the uh, his brother, perhaps, he may be witness of that. And so, the climax. Well, 
people are spreading the disease as fast as they can drive their cars out of town. Then to other aeroplanes, traffic the North Sea, landing here, there and everywhere, and they're perfectly airworthy, they're full of germs, because they've come from a uh, disease stricken country, and people don't know what it is. So people are dying here, there and everywhere. So the story ends with uh, the narrator uh, equipped to hope and hopes, driving from a remote sanctuary in Scotland down the 882 Bradford University Library. And as he arrived at the library in uh, Mercedes cross country lorry, uh, equipped for heavy duties, to take away the library box to his safe haven in the Highlands, he hears a funeral hymn being played from the church just across the way from the university reading. His father was a minister who preached in that very church. And so he knows that tune. And then he remembers a fellow at Bradford University who was certainly won't to write short stories. Who wrote the lines Once men built Fine palaces of steel and glass and stone. They, they rode the sky in winged ships that overtook the sun. Their voices bounced on mirrors up on high to speak in every home. Their markets full of many splendid things whose names are lost forever. The weeds are so tall in silent streets that used to echo with love, mainly University Avenue, Badger, where the narrator, an elderly man, is sobbing as he remembers his house and days in that very street. And weeds are so tall in University Avenue. That was only him and the man with his cargo of books and out of the mind. And it's proud in the University of Radcliffe. So that could be the fate of all mankind. You understand? At nature. Tricks back. Have any observations? Am I being exaggerating? David, we've got to go because they're closing because they're doing different service now. They've got right. <laughs> cool. nearly five o'clock. Thank you very much. Well, we've had an interesting dialogue. I'll be meeting you tomorrow and we've picked up